Welcome everyone. Today's Grand Rounds honors two recipients of our department's highly competitive and prestigious trainee research award, Josh Cohen and Francis Jha. And I'm particularly pleased that both of these individuals did their research work within the Dolby Family Center for Mood Disorders. Um, I'm going to be introducing Josh first, who works in my lab, and then Mazin is going to be introducing Francis, who will speak second, who works in his laboratory. Josh did his undergraduate work at Muhlenberg College before going on to the University of Alabama, Birmingham for his MD, PhD, and then coming to UCSF after that for his residency, where he's really distinguished himself multidimensionally. He's established himself as an emerging academic triple threat, not only receiving this research award, he's well known as an outstanding clinician and also been awarded accolades for his teaching. I think in his PGY one year, he won the outstanding teacher award and then repeated it in his PGY three, two year. And then I guess he slacked off in, in PGY three. I'm not sure what happened there, but um, his research really epitomizes what we're trying to do in the Dolby Family Center for Mood Disorders. That center consists of four basic science labs, two at UCSF, Vikas Sohal and Mason Kierbeck, and two at Stanford, Rob Malenka and Carl Dyseroth, and a clinical research project, primarily intracranial closed loop deep brain stimulation. And the intent of that structure is to create bi-directional translation across clinical and research and basic science research operations. And you know, Josh's project does just that. It started with an observation in humans with epilepsy of a biomarker, brain electrical activity pattern linked to a behavior. And then under the leadership of VCOS, it was back translated to animals with the intent that if you can identify when that brain electrical activity is patterned, pattern is present, the linked behavior in the animal serves as a uniquely validated animal model for the human condition you're hoping to study. And in that animal work, Josh was involved with the team that drilled down on understanding the cell types involved, refined the biomarker, and then after that work was completed, retranslated back to humans with depression who don't have the confounds of people with epilepsy and where better uh, refinement of the clinical state could occur. So I'm obviously very excited about this work and Josh has done a great job with it and we're very fortunate he's gonna be joining us as a faculty member in July, I'll give you Josh Cohen. Thank you for that uh, really warm introduction. It's, it's really an honor and a privilege to be giving this talk today. It's been an amazing four years um, that I've spent in residency here working with incredible colleagues and mentors. And I'm, I'm really excited to be able to share some of my work with you today. Um, specifically that work on amygdala hippocampal coherence and its uh, role as a biomarker of predominant symptom sets in patients with depression. Um, so before getting into things, I do have a financial disclosure. I work part-time as a consultant for a health tech company. Um, and with that, I can jump into the outline. So I'll start with some background, um, talk a little bit about challenges to biomarker development, talk about coherence, what it is, why we're talking about it in the first place, and then give a little background on the Presidio trial, which is a trial of deep brain stimulation for treatment of depression. I'll then talk, go into my current work, which is on amygdala hippocampal coherence and its relation to symptom severity. And lastly, just touch on some future directions where I'm currently working on trying to identify circuit behavior relationships and work on translating these findings to non-invasive non approaches. But first, why look at biomarkers in the first place? And broadly, that's because we need better treatments in psychiatry. We're all acutely aware that nearly a third of patients with major depressive disorder will fail to achieve remission despite multiple treatment trials. And that still current approaches to treatment selection are largely trial and error. Even in folks that medications work for, they often have to try several different options before they find the one that works for them. And so the hope is that by identifying biomarkers, we'll better understand the pathophysiology and mechanisms that underlie these disorders and be able to develop more targeted and efficacious approaches to treating them. 
And biomarker discovery in psychiatry has unfortunately been fairly limited in its progress. And that's due to some pretty significant challenges that our field faces. One of the primary ones is diagnostic heterogeneity. And what that means is that patients with the same DSM diagnosis can vary substantially in their symptomology and very likely vary in the etiology and pathophysiology of their disorders. So what that means in, in plainer English is that multiple patients, you could have multiple patients who meet criteria for major depressive disorder, um, but their symptoms are very different from each other. Um, we all know that clinically. And so one way researchers have tried to get around this is by trying to subgroup patients based on particular symptoms. So we can imagine a group, uh, several groups of patients with depression. One group primarily complains of the mood symptoms, that they feel sad, that their mood is down. Um, that's the core of their symptomology. We can imagine another group that complains of somatic symptoms. So for these folks, the primary symptoms they talk about are things like headaches, GI upset, other physical manifestations of depression. And the third group um, talks about fatigue and energy. They mostly complain about, again, having low energy or having fatigue. And so one approach would be to separate these, in, these groups into individual groups and then try to look for biomarkers related to each subset. So we can imagine identifying a biomarker related specifically um, to the group that mostly complains of low mood or sadness a different biomarker related to high somatic symptoms, and a third biomarker related to energy or fatigue. And this is certainly a, a very, a really valid approach and would like, will likely lead to interesting findings. Um, but I want to focus on a potential um, caveat or issue with taking this approach. And that has to do with subjective experience and the fact that different people are going to report subjective experiences differently. And so we can imagine a specific biomarker or a specific, a specific type of circuit activity that is described differently by different people. And so we can imagine a single uh, brain state or circuit activity and that's present in, in three different groups of people. And these people all describe it differently. One group says that they feel sad. Another group says that they feel tired. And a third group is saying, talking about how their stomach um, hurts or they, or they have a headache. And to cut to the punchline of this whole talk is that I will hope to argue that amygdala hippocampal coherence is a biomarker like this, a single biomarker or activity signature that's described differently by different patients. And so I keep talking about coherence. Um, let me just take a minute to explain what it is. Coherence is a way to describe how similar two signals are. Um, so you can have two functions, so it's, it's mathematically the cross correlation of two functions um, over the auto, auto correlation of those functions. Basically, if two functions are exactly the same, their coherence are one. If they are totally different and unrelated from each other, their coherence is zero. And so the functions I'm talking about are brain signals. So you could take an EEG trace and compare it to another EEG trace and see how similar those traces are. Um, and in the data that I'm going to be talking about, these are intracranial EEG. And so, you know, the reason, you know, we're interested in coherence and the reason we're, the reason we're interested in amygdala hippocampal coherence in the first place has to do um, with this previous study that linked amygdala hippocampal coherence um, to negative emotion in patients with epilepsy. So in this study, patients with epilepsy who had electrodes implanted across their brain, we could see some of the regions that they were implanted with um, in this figure. Um, they had electrodes implanted in order to map their epileptogenic focus because they were going to have surgery to remove it. And while they were waiting for the surgery and having this mapping done, uh, the researchers in this project asked them questions about their mood to try to link coherence between these different electrodes or the different regions with their mood. Um, and what they found was that specifically amygdala hippocampal coherence in this 13 to 30 hertz frequency band was negatively correlated with emotion or mood. And I'm using very vague terms like emotion and mood because these weren't clinical scales. Um, in this study, the patients basically saw a list of words and said which word they felt more like to get kind of an aggregate, how good or how bad that you, you feel. And the higher coherence, the more bad uh, these epilepsy patients felt. And this study leads to a very obvious next question. Does amygdala hippocampal coherence have anything to do with symptoms in patients with clinical depression? 
Um, the patients in that trial didn't have clinical depression, they had, they had epilepsy. Um, and so it's possible that finding is uniquely related to epilepsy, or it's just related to healthy controls and it doesn't have anything to do with clinical depression. And this is a particularly hard question to answer because we the patients with depression don't typically have a walk around with electrodes in their brain. Um, but this is where, you know, I was quite fortunate to be here at UCSF because there was an ongoing clinical trial of deep brain stimulation for depression that had several unique characteristics that made it possible to answer this question. In most studies with deep brain stimulation for depression, a single, uh, ele an electrode is put into a single brain region to try to stimulate that brain region to see if it helps for depression. This trial takes a different approach um, where it looks at multiple brain regions to try to develop personalized treatments to identify personal biomarkers of depression and to identify um, personal treatment settings. So patients had electrodes, 10 electrodes put in each electrode having multiple contacts. So we could record from over a hundred places in the brain across these 10 regions. Importantly, the amygdala and hippocampus are, in, are included in this. So I was able to answer this question, is amygdala hippocampal coherence related to depressive symptomology in patients with clinical depression? And the way, the way we measured symptomology was several ways. So we had several visual analog scales. So these are just zero to 100 ratings. How depressed do you feel right now? How anxious do you feel right now? How much energy do you have? We also looked at a Hamilton depression rating scale, which is a more standardized measure of depression symptomology. So it asks a couple of questions about different core features of depression. And we also looked at Stanford sleepiness scale to see how sleepiness might correlate with these other symptoms. Um, and what we found was fairly interesting. Amygdala hippocampal coherence was correlated with every single symptom scale. So this is VAS depression. The higher the amygdala hippocampal uh, coherence, the higher the rating on the visual analog depression scale, uh, an R squared of, of 0 0.108, um, P to the negative five, fairly significant. Um, even more so for Hamilton depression ratings, an R squared of 0.145. Um, this was also amygdala hippocampal coherence was also related to anxiety and energy, albeit to a lesser degree. So VAS anxiety um, had a p-value of 0.007, um, a, a weak but still significant relationship. The higher the coherence, the more anxiety patients reported, um, as well as energy, except in the opposite direction. The higher the coherence, the less energy um, patients reported. And so this had us begin to think about what exactly amygdala hippocampal coherence is measuring, since it seems to be related to all these different types of symptoms. And so that gave us the idea that perhaps this is a measure of overall distress. And so what we wanted to do was come up with a single measure to uh, quantify overall level of symptom severity or, or um, overall, overall symptom severity. And so what we, end, what we ended up doing was using principal component analysis. And so principal component analysis takes all of your data, maps it into a multidimensional uh, space, and finds a, a vector that explains the most variance in your overall data set. Basically a single variable that summarizes, um, that summarizes your, your data um, as, as succinctly as, as possible. And what we found was that this measure, the, um, what we call the pr predominant symptom set, the first principal component, was even more strongly related to amygdala hippocampal coherence than any single symptom scale. So this is this predominant symptom set or the first principal component. And the higher uh, the coherence, the higher in severity in that principal symptom set um, in the three patients um, in this trial, the R squared of 0.182, stronger than any of the individual um, scales. Interestingly, um, this was a very similar magnitude of the effect seen in the epilepsy patients. So these are now two completely different patient groups, two different um, disorders, depression and epilepsy, two different rating scales, yet the magnitude of the relationship between amygdala hippocampus and reported mood is similar, um, which I think is a pretty amazing um, finding. And so you know, one thing we found as we, as we started digging through this, this data is that this, this 
these predominant symptom sets varied across patients. And so what that means is that the individual symptoms uh, for each patient that related to coherence were different. So in patient A, VAS depression, anxiety, and Hamilton depression were related to amygdala hippocampal coherence. In patient B, only VAS depression and sleepiness were related to coherence. While in patient C, the HAMD sleepiness and energy were related um, to coherence. And so the important thing is there is no single scale that was significantly correlated with coherence in all three patients. And so if you try to separate these patients out the way that I had in that first slide by specific symptoms, amygdala hippocampal coherence may not come up as, as, an, as a biomarker related to any individual symptom scale. It's only by looking at individual symptom, individual symptomologies and aggregate that we were able to identify this. So the, again, the predominant symptom set was significantly correlated in patient A, patient B, and patient C. And so uh, again, a single kind of signature related to different symptomologies in different groups. And so this you know, an obvious, another obvious next question um, is what happens to coherence during therapeutic stimulation? So all the data I've shown, um, all the data I've shown is during resting state. So basically when the patient's just sitting there with electrodes, they're not, the electrodes aren't stimulating or doing anything. This signature is related to symptoms, but the stimulation sometimes makes them better. So what happens to coherence when they're feeling better due to stimulation? And so we looked at, we looked at that. I'm gonna show you the results here. This y-axis is coherence, and this is data I've already shown you. So this is the low periods of low mood. Um, we see high coherence, and this is periods of better mood during the rest or resting state, low coherence. So this is the graph I just showed you in a different form. And here is therapeutic stimulation. So when we stimulate patients and they report feeling better, um, coherence is greatly reduced. Now, an important thing to remember is there's plenty of stimulation that doesn't make them feel better. And so what happens to coherence during those periods? It's also reduced, but not to the same extent. Um, and so the important takeaway is that basically every single bar on this graph is different from the other bars, except, high, except when the patients are naturally in a better mood and when they receive therapeutic stimulation. Um, you know, we may and then I may have hoped that non-therapeutic stimulation would look just like when patients were in a bad mood, but we have to remember that stimulation is really complicated. When we are stimulating the brain, we are changing all sorts of circuits in ways we don't completely understand. So the fact that we still see a difference between these two groups, between non-therapeutic stimulation and therapeutic stimulation, and it's the way that it's predicted by, by the regression, I think is, is an important finding. And so I'd like to take a minute just to try to put these results into context. And so it's, it's not surprising that amygdala activity in the amygdala and hippocampus is related to depression. Um, these areas have been implicated in depression for decades. One of the oldest brain findings related to depression has to do with the fact that hippocampal volume loss is associated with depression. Um, there are studies that show that reduced size of the amygdala in women is associated with depressive symptoms. And um, a, there's been numerous um, reports of this very classic left amygdala finding that increased activation in the left amygdala in response to uh, emotional stimuli, particularly scary stimuli or, or emotional faces is associated with depression in both adults and adolescents. Um, and I highlight left amygdala because the stronger relationship in this data set was in the left amygdala and left hippocampus. Um, so what does activity between the amygdala and hippocampus do? What sort of information does this process? What's its function? Um, these regions are densely interconnected and um, uh, Francis is gonna give an excellent talk next where you'll learn all about connections between the ventral hippocampus and the amygdala. So I won't go into that, um, but I will talk just briefly about human data, um, what, what activity between these regions has been associated with. So this, there's activity between the amygdala and hippocampus is increased when humans um, uh, remember emotionally balanced memories. So if you give them a cue to remember something, you know, sad or uh, aversive, this will, um, activity will increase. Not so if it's something neutral. Um, changes in amygdala connectivity have been shown to be really important to discriminating ruminative states from other brain states in, in healthy volunteers. And um, patients with depression have greater functional connectivity between these regions 
particularly when they're encoding and recalling negative memory. So we could begin to start to build a hypothesis that um, this amygdala hippoco amygdala hippocampus biomarker is related to some sort of net ruminative state or, or negatively biased state. Um, and that might be related to why a greater coherence is related to uh, greater symptom severity or a worse mood. Um, last minute or two, I'll just briefly talk about where I'm going with this work. And that's uh, trying to identify neural circuits with machine learning and translating these um, uh, approaches to non-invasive uh, therapies and technologies. And so one thing I'm excited about is we've talked just about amygdala hippocampal coherence, but as I showed you, we have electrodes all across the brain. So I'm very interested in using these um, techniques to try to identify wider networks or circuits in which the amygdala hippocampal coherence participates and is, and is related to uh, mood and depressive symptomology. And just as an example of, of a technique is I'm gonna show a clustering analysis. And so this takes um, hundreds of brain region or electrode coherence pairs and tries to group them by similar, similarity. And we could see that this clustering, uh, this preliminary clustering puts things into pretty distinct groups. And the amygdala hippocampus, the dot that represents amygdala hippocampal 28 to 36 coherence is here in this group of red dots. And you know, future work will try to understand what are these other red dots? How do they interact with each other? Um, and again, this work is, this is quite preliminary. Um, I'm excited to, to see where it's gonna go. And then next is trying to translate this to non-invasive approaches. Um, there's only gonna be so few, there's never gonna be a ton of patients with uh, deep brain stimulation for depression. And so intracranial biomarkers that re rely on intracranial recordings are gonna be somewhat limited. So I'm very interested in understanding how the relationship between these intracranial biomarkers relate to measures that we can gain non-invasively, like fMRI. So the patients in this trial have undergone multiple fMRIs, and we're beginning to try to understand how amygdala hippocampal coherence relates to fMRI activity um, and how that might apply to other populations. Um, we can also use things like scalp EEG and other, other non-invasive markers. And then try to translate these to other approaches, to non-invasive ther therapy approaches like RTMS um, and uh, focused ultrasound, um, which could be done on patients without uh, non-invasive, which could be done on patients um, without doing surgery um, on them, um, with the ultimate goal of making circuit-targeted therapies a first-line treatment for mood disorders. So we can move from a trial and error approach, exemplified by you know this famous figure from Star D. Um, to personalized treatments um, where we use data such as EEG or fMRI um, to, uh, to design um, personalized treatments using like TMS or focused ultrasound to modulate brain activity and uh, improve um, quality of life. And so um, with that, I have to thank a lot of people. This is a huge study. I'm greatly, appre greatly appreciative of the entire Presidio team. Um, and I think I have some time for questions maybe. Yeah. yeah, the question was what time window am I looking at coherence? Um, and so the data shown is two and a half minutes prior to them putting in their mood survey. Um, and that has to do with Sometimes stimulation occurs pretty quickly, so it helps avoid overlap. However, I've, however, I've done sensitivity analyses, and if you look anywhere from, you have to look at for like at least a minute, but all the way up to like seven minutes, you'll be able to see an effect. So um, I showed data with two and a half minutes, but it's a strong effect. It's not dependent on that that window. Um, I've also experimented with how the chunks in which coherence is calculated. So I calculate it in five second chunks in this, but again, that's that's fairly um, robust for anywhere from a couple seconds up to about 30 seconds. Sorry, just a, a follow up, but related to your conclusions, like have you ever measured like while the animal, while the humans, sorry, <laughs> <laughs> while the humans are on task, or, because you, you talk about this idea of like memory and, and yeah. rumination, like, uh, so could this, is this, does this biomarker differ in say a resting state 
versus when they're actually on task? Yeah, so I'm, I'm incredibly interested in that question. And so, you know, Clara Starkweather, who's a neurosurgeon who works um, with the group and does a um, task based, um, does a uh, approach avoidance task. Um, I'm very interested in collaborating with her to see if we can apply some of these measures to, to her work. Um, one of the tough things is coherence has to be calculated at least over a, a second or two. And a lot of these tasks are, are done much quicker than that. And so there's some technical challenges that Clara and I are still working to overcome to see how we can apply, um, you know, short term measures of coherence to these very rapid um, tasks. Thanks, thanks, Josh, for this great talk. Um, it seems like one possible confounder might be central nervous arousal. And so I'm wondering if you have any reason to think that uh, the visual analog scales, particularly for depression and anxiety, might be affected by that and you know, maybe by a sort of subjective sense of fatigability or tiredness. And a related question, I'm also wondering what kind of differs in the environment between the mood reporting time points? Like, are those at different times of day? Mm -hmm different hours of, of yeah. rest? So super, Thanks. really good question. Um, and right now, the best way I can try to tease, tease apart arousal is trying to take like the visual analog energy scale and sleepiness scale as some as a subjective measure of arousal. And so in one of the patients, particularly the patient B, they're very linked. It's very hard to disentangle depression symptoms from energy and arousal symptoms. Whereas actually in like in the first patient, um, they seem to be separate. The depression, her scores on um, the VAS depression don't seem to really predict scores on energy. Um, but again, that's subjective. What I what I really love to do in the future is begin to bring an objective physiologic data into this, um, looking at things like heart rate and steps and and movement. And so you could you know uh, combine their activity with measures like this um, to try to disentangle that some more. Um, and the time of day effect is, is also super interesting. So these range from morning to night. Um, all of these, all the data I showed is, is from a 10 day inpatient stay. So they're here in the hospital. Um, so the environment's somewhat the same. Um, and it's again, kind of throughout the day, it really varies, but there are likely circadian effects that I'm not seeing um, and future work that tries to tease that out and look at time of day, look at circadian issues, look at arousal would be in incredibly interesting. Um, I haven't, um, been able to kind of start that yet. So I have a question. Um, I know time was limited. You didn't get to talk about your animal work yeah, yeah. and its relevance here, which I wish we had time to talk about. And as I remember, this biomarker shows up during a particular aspect of mm -hmm. the elevated plus maze task. How do you link that mm -hmm. to here? And how did your animal work inform your clinical application to depressed patients? Yeah, and so the you know work out of Vikas Sohal's lab with, with Adam Jackson that showed that the higher the coherence prior to the animal going into a task um, would predict how long it's spent in the more anxiogenic areas of the task. So for you know an elevated plus maze is it's it's an elevated maze. To, it looks like a plus. Two arms are closed. Two are open. And if you look at coherence before you put the animal in the maze, um, you could predict how much time it's going to spend in one arm or, or the other. Um, and so in, in the animal sense, I kind of interpret that data as, as, as a kind of uh, how, it's, how it's responding to risk. And so yeah, when coherence is high, the animal seems less, like, less likely to engage in risky behavior. Um, and that's behavior that might be rewarding. It's exploration is really important to the mice. It's how they find food. It's, um, um, but it's also dangerous. And so, you know, I think that gets to when I, I called this a negatively biased state. So in humans, you know, perhaps it has something to do again with it, like not feeling like you want to try things, feeling negatively biased, things are going to go wrong. Things are, things aren't going to work out for you. So the mouse doesn't want to go into the area where it might get snatched up or eaten. Things might go bad. The human doesn't want to, you know, try new things. Um, and that's kind of a very hand wavy um, explanation. It'll be interesting to kind of get more descriptive um, responses of how people feel during, you know, uh, when this biomarker is active. One last question, then we have to turn it over. Um, the fact that you have a biomarker that is linked to different symptom scales in different people, 
seems to have important implications for future efforts to develop biomarkers. Could you speak to that? Yeah, I wish I had more time in, in the talk. And so, um, for example, in that first, if we had split people up by just scale, we wouldn't ha have found this biomarker. And so I think it shows the importance of really doing deeper um, assessments um, in individuals. So, you know, classically, if you do a clinical trial for depression, you do a modris maybe three or four times every couple of weeks, and you just use that full score, like, does this improve depression or, or does it not? I think really across our, our research, we have to be doing um, deeper phenological you know, uh, assessments, uh, really understanding what are the symptoms people are experiencing, how those symptoms fluctuate, and um, how our treatments or interventions affect that, and how that relates to biology. Thank you. Mason, would you take over from here? Thank you, Josh. Thank you, everyone.